and she is not doing it. Resuming debate, reprise uh, de débat, the RO member for South Okanagan, West Kootenay. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I'm happy to say I'm be splitting my time with the member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Um, I'm happy to speak here this afternoon on this motion. On the surface, it would be seem to be about holding the government to account to commitments for openness and transparency. And my two NDP colleagues who spoke early, uh, earlier uh, spoke to that theme of transparency. And I have to thank my colleague from Rosemont Le Petit Patrie for pointing out the delicious irony of a Conservative motion asking for more openness and transparency. And there's another irony in the Conservative debate, the focus of standing up for low-income Canadians. The first two speeches we heard from the Conservatives told stories of low-income people in Ontario who literally have to choose between heating their home and eating, or even being able to afford to keep their home at all. These stories say more about the low incomes of these citizens after years of unreasonably low pensions for seniors and people with disabilities, restrictions on employment insurance, bungled energy pricing, and a complete retreat from affordable housing than they do with any inflated fears about what carbon pricing might bring. Too many Canadians live below or near the poverty line, and we should all be constantly working in this House to change that shameful record. So while some Conservative speakers have insisted that this is not an indictment of carbon pricing, it's clearly a tactic to, a tactic to attack that policy. Madam Speaker, I want to spend much of my time talking not about the cost of climate action, but on the cost of inaction. First, on a global scale, The Economist published an analysis that said an increase of five degrees Celsius, and really that's where we're headed if the world follows the policies of this and previous Canadian governments on climate action, will cost at least seven trillion dollars. Seven trillion dollars. That's more than the capitalization of the London Stock Exchange. Can you imagine the London Stock Exchange collapsing? That's what we're facing on the global front. Citibank has come up with an even more drastic estimate of over $40 trillion cost over the next 40 years. In Canada, the National Roundtable on the Environment and Economy came up with estimates of the price of inaction back in 2011. That price for Canadians was put at $5 billion per year, and that would rise to $43 billion by 2050. That estimate hasn't been updated lately because the previous government dis disbanded that roundtable that did such good nonpartisan work on this and other issues. So there's another thing the Liberal government could do, bring back the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy. The federal government actually does come up with cost estimates as well, although they tend to be hidden, as we've seen today, hidden as fo footnotes in other reports. The latest figures are about $40 per tonne of carbon now, and that would rise to $75 per tonne by 2050. These costs are still higher than the revenues brought in by any carbon price scheme in Canada. And many of the costs of inaction are not well represented by dollars alone. The catastrophic fires of Fort McMurray last year and the fires in my riding around Rock Creek, British Columbia the year before forever altered the lives of thousands of people. Floods in Calgary earlier had a similar impact. And Calgary faces the opposite effect over the long term as the glaciers in the Rocky Mountains, the sole source of water for that city, disappear over the next century. Ocean acidification is already impacting shellfish farms along the BC coast. And forests are being devastated by more frequent fires and insect outbreaks across Canada, both driven by climate change. It's hard to come up with a cost for the mountain pine beetle epidemic that killed more than half the pines in British Columbia in a few short years. Those beetles took off during a long period of year after year hot, dry summers and warm winters. That epidemic changed the forest industry of BC forever, hollowing out communities across the interior of the province and is now threatening the Alberta forest industry. And now that the salvage operations are over for the beetle kill, allowable cuts are going down to be lowered significantly in BC over the next few years, exacerbating the economic impact. And we're now facing spruce beetle epidemics in BC that are taking advantage of the similar climate patterns. And finally, there are the deep cultural impacts that climate change is having and will continue to have in communities throughout the Canadian Arctic. 
These communities and cultures have developed over millennia with traditions dependent on seasonal patterns of sea ice, and those patterns are changing quickly, even disappearing. The effect that this will have on Arctic communities is difficult to assess or even put in words. So the price of inaction is astronomical. We must look for ways to min minimize these unacceptable costs. And pretty much any economist from any country in the world will tell you that the cheapest way to tackle climate change is to put a price on carbon. That action would minimize the ongoing impacts of climate change, both financially and socially, on all Canadians. And there are other actions that would help as well. One expert I recently talked to, me, talked to told me that efficiency is the best new fuel. So one easy action for this government to take would be to bring back the Eco Energy Home Retrofit Program. This popular program ran from 2007 to 2012 and helped hundreds of thousands of Canadians retrofit their homes, lowering their energy bills by 20%, creating thousands of good local jobs, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions by three tons per year for each house. While the program cost the federal government $900 million over about five years, it leveraged more than $4 billion in retrofit investments by Canadian families. And when homeowners invest in new windows, insulation, and other energy-saving projects, that money circulates through communities across this country. This program combines everything that the Liberal government likes, leveraged infrastructure investments, carbon emission reductions, and helping the middle class and those struggling to join it. So to conclude, I would simply say that the Conservatives, who are usually champion policies that help the financial bottom lines of Canadians, should get behind the price on carbon. Climate change is one of the biggest threats facing Canadians and the global community, and avoiding action now would cost all of us significantly in the long term. And to the government, I would remind them that they promised to be open and transparent with Canadians, and it's beyond time that they clearly articulated how they will address climate change with a real plan. We've heard a lot about real change, now we need a real plan. Several provinces have, provinces have introduced measures to help low- and middle-income households adapt to measures to combat climate change, but there's no sign of federal leadership to ensure that fair programs are in place across this country. We in the NDP want this government to build a just transition to a greener economy, one that creates good jobs across the country. That's what Canadians expect from this government, not foot-dragging. Thank you. Questions and comments? Question.